Jai Sean. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> they, they really make me smile. Thank you all for coming to this year's Story Hour presented by the Library Corner. Today, we will visit a farm. We will ask, who do you see? We will bundle up for a winter scene. Then we will move on to a countryside and we will travel to Italy, and then our stories bring us back to a small town we call Saugus. Our first class is our cherubs. They are presenting Click Clack Moo, Cows That Type. Curtains, please. <laughs> Click, clack, moo. Cows that type by Doreen Cronin. Pitches by Betsy Lewin. Farmer Brown has a problem. His cows like to type. All day long he hears click, clack, click, clack, clickety, clack. At first, he couldn't believe his ears. Cows that type? Impossible. Click, clack, click, clack. Clickety-clack. No. Then he couldn't believe his... Dear Farmer Brown, the barn is very cold at night. We'd like some electric blankets. Sincerely, the cows. It was bad enough the cows had found the old the barn. Now they wanted electric blankets. No way, said Farmer Brown. No electric blankets. So the cows went on strike. They left a note on the barn door. Sorry, we're closed. No milk today. No milk today, cried Farmer Brown. In the background, he heard the cows busy at work. Click, clack. No. Click, clack. No. Clickety, clack. No. The next day, he got another note. Dear Farmer Brown, the hens are cold too. They'd like electric blankets. Sincerely, the cows. Sorry. <laughs> the cows were growing impatient with the farmer. They left a note on the barn door. Closed. No milk. No eggs. No eggs, cried Farmer Brown. In the background, he heard them. Click, clack. No. Click, clack. No. Clickety, clack. No. Cows that type, hens on strike. Who ever heard of such a thing? How can I run a farm with no milk and no eggs? Farmer Brown was furious. Farmer Brown got out his own typewriter. Dear cows and hens, there will be no electric blankets. You are cows and hens. I demand milk and eggs. Sincerely, Farmer Brown. Hmm, Duck was a neutral party. So he brought the ultimatum to the cows. 
The cows held an emergency meeting. All the animals gathered around the barn to snoop, but none of them could understand moo. All night long, Farmer Brown waited for an answer. Duck knocked on the door. Early the next morning, he handed Farmer Brown a note. Dear Farmer Brown, we will exchange our typewriter for electric blankets. Leave them outside the barn door, and we will send Duck over with the typewriter. Sincerely, the cows. Farmer Brown decided this was a good idea. He left the blankets next to the barn and waited for Duck to come with the typewriter. The next morning, he got a note. Dear Farmer Brown, the pond is quite boring. We'd like a diving board. Sincerely, the ducks. Click, clack. Click, clack. Quack. Click, click clack. clack. Quack. Click, clack, quack. And all the cows and ducks were very, very happy. Farmer Brown wasn't. The end. Cherubs, take a bow. <laughs> Farmer Brown, thank you. They have been practicing, so for everybody here, these children have been practicing this for the past five weeks. In 30 minutes, <laughs> they have, li just so that everybody knows, they have library class for 40 minutes, so by the time they get settled in and you know, getting ready to go back downstairs. So the, the class is probably about 30 to 35 minutes. So in 30 to 35 minutes between the past four and five weeks, all these classes have mastered this. So they definitely do. Nice job. Here at EBCCS, and a hush. A hush falls over the auditorium. Here at EBCCS, we do our own adaption to the story, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? The original book is written by Bill Martin, Jr., and the drawings are done by Eric Kahl. So if our angels are ready, curtains, please. Whenever you are ready, we're all set for you. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Natalia, Natalie, yeah, Natalia, the, Natalie, Natalie, who do you see? Natalie. Who do you see? Thank you. <laughs> Victoria, Victoria, who do you see? Dan, Dan, who do you see? I see Aurora looking at me. 
Aurora, Aurora, who do you see? Giovanni, Giovanni, who do you see? Giovanni, who do you see? I see. Who's that? I see somebody looking out from behind the curtains. Let me see. <gasps> Giovanni, Giovanni, who do you see? Who's that? I see Felicity. Do you see Felicity looking at you? I see Felicity looking at me. Felicity, Felicity, who do you see? Uh, Samantha, Samantha, who do you see? Lumaya, Lumaya, who do you see? Ah, oh. <laughs> Mrs. Nastari, Miss Marfioti, who do you see? Victoria, Dan, Aurora, Giovanni, Felicity, <coughs> Samantha, and Lumaya looking at us. That's who we see. Angels, angels, who do you see? <laughs> So as our curtain closes, we will now get ready to do our next story, which is our kindergarten classroom, who will be doing Snowman at Night. And this story was written by Carolyn Wayner, and the pictures are by Mark Wayner as well. Snowman at night. Curtains, please. I think our snowmen are beginning to get built. That's probably what's happening back there. It takes a lot to put snowmen together. And I'm sure once you see when they come out, you'll see the amount of work that the teachers had to do to put all these beautiful costumes together. Are we ready back there? Okay. Curtains, please. Snowman at night. One wintry day, I made a snowman, very round and tall. The next day when I saw her, she was not the same at all. Her hat had slipped, her arms had drooped, 
he really looked a fright. It made me start to wonder, what do snowmen do at night? I think that snowmen start to slide when it gets really dark, off the lawn and down the street, right into the park. They gather in a circle while they wait for all the others, sipping cups of ice-cold cocoa made by snowman mothers. Then the snowman games begin. They line up in their places, each one anxious for his turn in snowman races. And everyone has had a chance at racing once or twice. They go on over to the pond to do skating tricks on ice. They're doing a great job skating. Look at that. Wow. Single blade skating, too. Sometimes they start giggling. And then they act like clowns. They bump into each other till they all fall down. <laughs> they gather up their snowballs. The pitcher takes his aim. And underneath the moonlight sky, they play a baseball game. Good job. Good job. No one knows just how it started, but soon it's quite a sight with snowmen throwing snowballs in the world's best snowball fight. Then it's time for sledding. It's a wild ride downhill. Time for sledding. It's a wild ride downhill. Wahoo, they yell. This is by far the snowman's biggest thrill. Finally, they're all tucked out and getting very sleepy. So they slowly gather up their things and one by one they go. So if your snowman's grin is crooked or he's lost a little height, you'll know he's just been doing what snowmen do at night. Please take a bow. Kayla. I'm going to leave the snowballs on the stage so they can melt. <laughs> so I have promised that classroom I have promised that classroom that next week we will take the snowballs outside and we will actually have a snowball fight.
Our next story is done by our first grade classroom, and the story is called Stone Soup. It's by Ann McGovern, pitches by Winslow Penny Peels, and we need a hush over the auditorium. A young man was walking. He walked and walked and walked. He walked all night long. He was tired and he was hungry. At last he came to a big house. What a fine house, he said. There will be plenty of food for me here. He knocked on the door. A little old lady opened it. Good lady, said the young man. I am very hungry. Can you give me something to eat? I have nothing to give you, said the little old lady. I have nothing in my home. I have nothing in my garden. And she began to close the door. Stop, said the young man. If you will not give me something to eat, will you give me a stone? A stone, said the little old lady. What will you do with a stone? You cannot eat a stone. Ah, said the young man, I can make soup from a stone. Now the little old lady had never heard of that. Soup from a stone? The young man handed the young man handed the lady a gray stone. This stone will make a wonderful soup, he said. Now give me a pot. The little old lady got a pot fill the pot with water and put it on the fire, said the young man. The little old lady did as she was told and soon the water was bubbling in the pot. The young man put the round gray stone into the pot. Now we will wait for the stone to cook, he said. The pot bubbled and bubbled. After a while, the little old lady said, this soup is cooking fast. It is cooking fast now, said the hungry young man, but it would cook faster with some onions. So the little old lady went to the garden and got some yellow onions. And into the pot, went the yellow onions with the ground gray stone. Soup from a stone, said the little old lady. <laughs> the pot bubbled and bubbled and bubbled. After a while, the little old lady said, this soup smells good. It smells good now, said the hungry young man, but it would smell better with some carrots. So the little old lady got some carrots and put them in the pot. And into the pot went the carrots and the yellow onions and the ground gray stone. 
Soup from a stone, said the little old lady. Fancy that! Blah. And the pot bubbled, bubbled and bubbled and bubbled. After a while, the little old lady said, This soup tastes good. It tastes good now, said the hungry young man, but it would taste better with some beef bones. <gasps> so the little old lady got some juicy beef bones into the pot went the juicy beef bones, some thin carrots, some yellow oran ye or yeah, onions, and the round gray stone. Soup from a stone, said the little old lady. Fancy that! Wow. The pot bubbled. bubbled. After a while, the little old lady said, this soup is fit for a prince. It is fit for a prince now, said the hungry young man, but it would be fit for a king with a bit of pepper and a handful of salt. So the little old lady got the pepper and the salt. Into the pot went a bit of pepper and a handful of sauce and the juicy beef bones and the thin carrots and the yellow onions and the round gray stone. Soup from a stone, said the little old lady. Fancy that! Ah! The pot bubbled and bubbled and bubbled. After a while, the little old lady said, This, this soup is too thin. It is too thin now, said the hungry young man, but it would be nice and thick with some butter and barley. So the little old lady went and got some butter and barley. Into the pot went the butter and barley with a bit of pepper and a handful of salt and a juicy beef bone and thin carrots and yellow onions and the round gray stone. Soup from a stone, said the little old lady. Fancy The pot bubbled and bubbled and bubbled. After a while, the little old lady tasted the soup. This is good soup, she said. Yes, said the hungry young man. This soup is fit for a king. Now we can eat it. Stop, said the little old lady. This soup is indeed fit for a king, but now we have to set the table. So she took out her dishes and she set the table. Then the little old lady and the hungry young man ate the soup. The soup made with butter and barley, bit of pepper, salt, juicy beef bones, thin onions, thin carrots, and the round gray stone. Soup from a stone, said the little old lady. Fancy that! Wow. Now I must be on my way, said the young man. He took the stone out of the pot and put it into his pocket. Just be careful, it might be hot in there. What are you take? Why are you taking the stone? said the little old lady. Well, said the young man, the stone is not cooked enough, and I will have to cook it some more, and tomorrow I will do that. And the young man said goodbye. He walked down the road. He walked, and he walked, and he walked. What a fine supper I will have tomorrow, he said to himself. Soup from a stone. That is soup from a stone. And if anybody would like that recipe, I will give it to you very, very gladly. Please stand up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. So no matter how many times you practice something, it always gets a little changed when they do come up on the stage. So.
So one of my favorite children's authors is Tommy DiPaolo. And he has some amazing characters. And a couple of his amazing characters are Strega Nona and Big Anthony. And that's who we will be seeing today in our second grade's production of Strega Nona. So boys and girls, a hush falls over the auditorium. Whenever you're ready, curtains, please. In a town in Calabria, a long time ago, there lived an old lady. Everyone calls Thraganona, which meant Grandma Witch. Although all the people in town talked about her in whispers, they all went to see her if they had troubles. Even the priests and the sisters of the convent went because Straganorna had a magic touch. She could cure a headache with oil and water and a hairpin. She made a special potion for girls who wanted husbands. She was also very good at getting rid of warts. But Straganona was getting old, and she needed to, for someone to help her with her little home and her garden. So she put up a sign in the town square. And Big Anthony, who didn't pay any attention, went to see her. Anthony, said Strega, sweep the house and wash the dishes. You must weed the garden and pick the vegetables. You must feed the goat and milk her. And you must fetch the water. For this, I will give you three coins and a place to sleep and food to eat. Oh, grazie, said Big Anthony. The one thing you must never do, said Strega Norna, is touch the pasta pot. It is very valuable, and I don't let anyone touch it. Ah, see, said Big Anthony. And so the days went by. Big Anthony did his work, and Straganona met with the people who came to see her for headaches and husbands and warts. Big Anthony had a nice bed to sleep in and a goat shed to sleep and, a, and goats to feed. One evening, when Big Anthony was milking the goat, he heard Straganona singing. Peeking in the window, he saw Straganona standing over the pasta pot. And she sang. And the pot bubbled and bubbled and was suddenly steaming with pasta. <laughs> then Straganorna sang. And she sang enough to pot. I have my pasta nice and hot. So simmer down my pot of clay until I'm hungry another day. How wonderful, said Big Anthony. This is a magic pot for sure. And Straganona called Big Anthony in for supper. But too bad for Big Anthony, because he didn't see Straganona blow three kisses to the pasta pot. <laughs> and this is what happened. The next day, when Big Anthony went to the town square to fetch the water, he said everyone, he told everyone about the pasta pot. And naturally, everyone laughed at him because it sounded so silly. The pot that cooked all by itself. Why? You can go confess to the priest, Big Anthony. <laughs> and Big Anthony was angry, and that wasn't a very good thing to be. I'll show them, said Big Anthony. 
Someday I'll get the pasta pot and make it cook, and they'll be sorry. That day came sooner than even Big Anthony would have thought, because two days later, Straganana said to Big Anthony, Anthony, I must go over to the mountain, to the next town, to see my friend Strager Amelia. Sweep the house and weed the garden, feed the goat and milk her, and for lunch, there is some bread and cheese in the cupboard. And remember, don't touch the pasta pot. Ah, see, see, said Big Anthony. But he was thinking, this is my chance. As soon as Straganona was out of sight, Big Anthony went to the inside, pulled the pasta pot off the shelf, put it on the floor, and now let's see if I remember the words. So his, so his words were, bubble, bubble, pasta pot, boil me some pasta nice and hot. I'm hungry and it's time to sup. Boil enough pasta to fill me up. And soon enough, the pot bubbled and bubbled and began to fill up with pasta. Aha, said Big Anthony. He ran to the town square, jumped on the fountain and said, Get plates and forks and come to Straganona's house. Big Anthony had made the magic pasta, so everyone laughed and ran home to get the fox and the plates and the platters and everything. And they were all going to Straganona's house, and Anthony was very happy to start feeding them. He was a hero. He scooped out the pasta and filled the plates and the platters and the bowls. There was more than enough for all the townspeople, including the priests and the sisters from the convent. And some people were able to get seconds and maybe even thirds. When all had their filling, Big Anthony sang... His words were, enough, enough, my pasta pot. I have my pasta nice and hot, so simmer down my pot of clay until I'm hungry another day. But alas, he did not blow the three kisses. He went outside to the applause of the crowd. Big Anthony took a bow. He was so busy listening to the compliments from everyone that he didn't know that the pasta was still bubbling and bubbling and bubbling until a sister from the convent said, <gasps> and pasta was pouring out of the pot. Ah, well, maybe it fell on the floor too, but that's okay. Big Anthony rushed in, shouting the magic words again and again, but the pot kept bubbling. He took the pot off the, and put it on the floor, but the pasta kept bubbling. Big Anthony grabbed a cover and put it on the pot and sat on it. But the pasta raised and kept covering Big Anthony, and Anthony fell on the floor. And had it not been for the mayor who came and rescued him, he would have ended up being covered with pasta. Through the windows, through the doors, everywhere was pasta. The townspeople began to worry. Do some... <laughs> Big Anthony sang the magic song again, but without the three kisses. And the pasta kept coming and coming and coming. We must protect our town from the pasta, said the mayor. But even that didn't work. The pot kept bubbling and the pasta kept coming out. We are lost, said the people. The, the priests and the nuns from the convent 
began to pray. The pasta will cover our town, they said, and it certainly would have had it not been for Straganona, who came down the road, and she didn't have to look twice. She knew what had happened. She sang the magic song and blew three kisses with a sputter. The pot stopped boiling and the pasta came to a halt. Oh, grazie, thank you, Straganona, the people cried. Grazie, thank you, Straganona. But they turned on poor Anthony and said, Now, now, wait, said Straganona. The punishment must fit the crime. Anthony, please get a plate from one of the people in the crowd, and you must begin eating all the pasta. So Anthony began to eat all the pasta. The town was never the same again, and Big Anthony might never have learned his lesson because he really wasn't paying attention to Straganona. Thank you, second grade. So I have to say, Amir was absent today, and Claire did an amazing job learning her lines first thing this morning. So a special hand, a round of applause. She did a really good job. Thank you. And where's my pasta boy? My pasta boy, please. We could not have had pasta in our pot bubbling and bubbling had it not been. So he was the man behind the scenes. So I'm going to give them a few minutes to set everything up backstage, but I'd like to tell you a little bit something about this next story. So boys and girls and everybody else in our audience, a hush. Traditionally, we read stories that are well known to everybody, stories that you would find anywhere on a bookshelf in a library. Um, this year, I decided to do something a little bit different. This story, I can still hear it. This story is called Waffles, Waffles, Waffles. And it was written by, at that time, a fifth grade student who is now one of our seventh grade students. When I read the story, I was amazed at how she put this whole story together. And I hemmed and I hawed, and then I finally said, I am going to break away from tradition, and I am going to highlight one of our own students today. Her name is Isabella Stantoro. She is in the seventh grade. And we will talk a little bit more about the story after. But I had to do some editing, so I truly hope I have done her story justice. It is much longer than what you will see on the stage today, but in order for the students to present it, I had to adapt some of it. And Isabella kept saying to me, whatever you have to do, whatever you have to do is okay. So Isabella, I do hope I make you proud. <laughs> waffles, Waffles, Waffles by Isabella Santoro. Please open the curtains. Oh no, what a disaster. I knew the day was coming, but didn't realize it was today. My dad said he would buy a waffle maker when it got close to Halloween. Today was that day. I was worried. I heard my dogs barking and they only barked. 
<laughs> when my dad woke up, my dad slowly walked from his bed into the kitchen. And then we smelt it. He was already pouring the batter. My brother and I went to the kitchen and we heard him scream. <laughs> we ducked down and waffles came flying across the kitchen in a blink of an eye. I tried to shut off the waffle maker, but stopped when I saw the dogs licking the batter off the floor. I had to put my dogs outside. My dad wiped his head. And I began wiping the floor. We left the dogs outside. Anyway, I still need to introduce my family. I have a brother. His name is not brother. It's Derek. My dad's name is also Derek. It isn't that confusing. My mom's name is Regina, but nobody calls her that. We call her mom. Back to my story. We thought the waffle mess was over, but it had just begun. My mom and my dad left the house for the day and left us under the waff watchful eyes of our grandmother. My brother got hungry and wanted a snack. I told him it was too early for a snack, so he thought breakfast would be a good idea. He started pressing random buttons on the waffle maker, hoping that the waffles would come out, and to my surprise, they did. Waffle after waffle was flying out of the machine. My grandmother was so nervous, she couldn't help but laugh. She bent down to pick up the waffles. It was not good for my dogs to have all these waffles. So we brought everything outside. My brother and my grandmother followed. We needed a plan. We could return to my house, but just then, my friend Alex came. She grabbed a pencil, and we drew the house's entrance. A back door was close to the waffle maker, and you only had to take a few steps inside to shut it off. This is the best way. We were arguing about who should do it. It would be best if we both did. We all ran back inside. We were shocked at how many waffles there were. We slowly went in, pressed the button, and stopped it. And it finally stopped. We thought our worries were over, but we realized a giant waffle invasion was in my house. We had to hide or remove all the waffles before our parents got home. That's when I came up with an idea. We could sell them. We took some waffles outside and set them up on a table, but nobody wanted them. We even tried making fancy packages out of them, but still we lost hope. That's when my brother had an idea. What if we hide them? We all thought it was a good idea. We put some in the bushes. We threw them as far as possible. We even hid them in the people's yards. And we were so relieved we were going to celebrate. We heard a on the door. We opened it, and there was our neighbor with the note. It read, Alex and I didn't have any more room to eat waffles. We called our friends, Emmanuel and David and Fatima, and anybody else who wanted to come over. We told them about our idea to get to work making signs. Alex stood up and said, all right, all kids, right. we're going to make some posters. Here's what it's going to say. Dear, dear animals, we have a surprise. Just follow the arrows for a meal. As we made posters, we put out a table, we put out cones, we set the table, 
and laid out all the cones for all the animals to follow. As we waited, a little squirrel saw the sign and thought it was a trap. Little squirrel thought the coyotes were trying to get the little animals to go for dinner. The squirrels didn't go. All the little animals felt the same way. You could hear their stomachs rumble. <laughs> They wanted food, but didn't want to be the food. They came up with a good idea. They called a blue jay over to see if there were any coyotes. The squirrels and the groundhogs waited for the blue jay to return, but he didn't. The animals were worried. They thought the coyotes might have gotten him, and they needed to help their friend. So they ran, and they followed the cones until they saw the blue jay, who was just sitting there with a waffle in his beak. Alex and I were cutting up the waffles when Carson, Alex's brother, said, Look, your grandma. Look what your grandma is doing. My grandmother was there reading a story to the animals. And the groundhog caught her attention, and the animals all sat down with her. There were so many friendships made that day, and many waffles. Everybody was talking to their animal friends. The little kids were playing with the younger kids. My grandma was talking to the older children, the older animals. There were no more waffles. All the animals and all the neighbors went home. We thanked them, but just then, my parents came home, and my dad said, I'm hungry, ready for waffles. <laughs> Third. So, In our audience today, in our audience today, we have Derek, Regina, and the grandmothers. So, very proud parents, and you should be, very proud. So I do hope I did Isabella's story justice. They have really worked very hard on making this as close to her original story as possible. So as you can see, there are many, many talented authors out there, but it would not have done us justice had we not recognized one of our own students. The students in this school are beyond talented, and it is just a great opportunity to be, high, to be able to highlight one of their stories. And I hope in years to come, I'm going to be able to do more and more stories just like this. Third grade, take a bow. Thank you. So once again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. You won't know the mishaps that happened on the stage. I truly will. So I think we're going to have to extend maybe from four weeks or five weeks of training. Ah, no, we're just going to leave it the way it is. It is what it is. So honestly, it is what it is. When you're working with children that are three, four, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, whatever happens, happens. There are so many people. Shh, shh, hush. A hush. Thank you. There are so many people to thank, and the list is endless, but I do, I do have to have a special, a special thanks to my seventh grade students who are our stage hands. And eighth, I'm sorry, seventh and eighth grade students. We are live streaming this. So Mr. Rivero, thank you very much for live streaming it. Faculty and staff, thank you for your support throughout this whole thing. 
um, encouragement every single morning. This is going to be fine. Don't worry about it. My friends who donated some of their costumes, sorry, that was the best we could do with a limited budget. And most of all, to Isabella's parents. Um, thank you. And last but not least, to all my angels, cherubs, kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. Thank you. You all make my heart go. Thank you. Not last. We have one more person to thank. Our lower level. Who did, who did Mrs. Casaletto leave out? Who'd she forget to thank? Can we have a round of applause for my mother, Mrs. Casaletto? Thank you all for coming today, and I can't wait to see what we do for Story Hour next year. Oh. <laughs> Enjoy the beautiful weather outside.